tackle climate change effectively, they say intensive farming and food waste are damaging the planet. US officials interview nearly 700 factory workers after what's believed to be America's largest immigration raid in Mississippi. And in this week's Impact Minds, we're asking, how do we fight online hate? That's coming next with our panel. On Saturday, minutes before he opened fire and killed 22 people at a supermarket in El Paso, Texas, the gunman had posted a four-page statement on the website 8chan, apparently justifying his attack. Hours later, a Twitter account in Ohio liked several posts related to that shooting, and it's now thought that account belonged to the man who went on to kill nine people at a nightclub in the town of Dayton. The link between mass shootings and online hate culture is indisputable. The El Paso shooter himself referenced the attack in Christchurch in New Zealand in March, which was live streamed on 8chan. But what can be done to break up this malign web? Well, with me on Impact Minds today to discuss how to fight online hate are the executive director of the Global Disinformation Index, Claire Melford, the author and journalist, Peter Pomerantsev, and joining our panel from Washington, Karen Kornblue, who's former US ambassador to the OECD, and Karen is now director of the Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. So welcome all uh, to our panel debate uh, this week. And I want to ask you in the wake of El Paso for some initial thoughts on what matters most, what can be done to fight online hate. Claire. Thank you. The first thing uh, I would suggest is that we stop thinking of uh, online hate or, or disinformation as a, as a thing. It is a, a process. Uh, somebody does not become ra radicalized in the work of a, of a moment. It is a, a long-term uh, event that happens over many platforms with lots of different online uh, sites, 4chan, 8chan, Facebook, Google, Twitter, all playing a role in slowly shaping someone's views. So the first thing is to think of it as a, a process and not an event. And the second thing that is important is to really uh, follow the money. This is not just something that's about political ideologies, it is about making money. The more you can engage somebody online, the longer you can get them to spend on your website, the more advertising dollars you can make. And that is an automatic process. So that generates the incentive for, for platforms, for website owners, to create very sticky content that engages us. And we are much more likely to be engaged by our negative emotions, our fear, our hate, our disgust, our envy than we are by our positive emotions. I think we you're are showing us just what a big challenge this is yeah. uh, to start. And, and Peter, where would you focus us? I think we have to understand also how um, far-right groups especially are evolving. Um, so the El Paso shooter invoked um, ideas which are popularized by the identitarian movement. Uh, I interviewed them in, in a new book and they told me, look, you're still fighting the old far right, where the new far right were much, much mm. cleverer. They actually use the language of democracy movements. They say that they have to defend women's rights and therefore they want to get rid of all Muslims in Europe. Um, uh, the shooter actually talks about uh, how he wanted to preserve diversity um, and thus stop intermarriage, because intermarriage was, you know, was ridding America of its ethnic diversity. So they're getting much cleverer. Um, they don't necessarily fall into the old categories of hate speech as we kind of came up with them in the 20th so it's got century. To be a sophisticated fight back. That means it's the people that are going to have to do this. There's going to have to be people, groups, civil society groups who tackle this problem and reach out to vulnerable audiences. And Karen Cornblow in Washington, what is your top priority in, in beginning this fight against online hate? Well, one of the things that we need to do is, is think about the substrate that this is happening on, which is the internet. And we've had this idea that the internet was necessarily good for the voiceless and democracy, and that all connections were good and all speech was good. And what we've seen with uh, 8chan, which is the rogue website that allows a lot of these white supremacists to organize on, or Gab, which is a similar one, the Daily Stormer, which is a Nazi website, is uh, we need to think really uh, long and hard about the kinds of vulnerabilities of the internet to these kinds of illegal, uh, hate-filled, um, uh, 
spewing sites and, and what kinds of things we can do about them that don't impinge on free expression for others. There's a lot to chew on here. I want to come back first, uh, Claire, to your thought about follow the money because the business model of fake news is something I think people don't necessarily realise. There's a lot of money to be made, being made. There is, absolutely. Uh, at the Disinformation Index, we've collected 20,000 disinforming domains, which is by no means the entire spectrum of disinforming websites across the world. But just in that small sample of 20,000, we estimate that every year, almost a quarter of a billion dollars of advertisers' money ends up on those sites. And that's uh, not something that the advertisers at the moment have any control over, but it is something that allows the people who create disinforming content, hate speech, to keep on doing it. What and do you mean the advertisers don't have any control over it? It's not possible. Adver advertising online is largely placed automatically by computers in real time. In the second that you click on a web page, the ads load a little bit later, and that is because a real time auction is happening uh, in that moment. And that uh, does not rely on any humans. So that's a, a brand, structural problem, isn't it? It's a system structural ecosystem problem, yeah. And Peter, I know you've looked a lot at uh, how the internet is used and abused and used for propaganda too. Yeah, I mean, look, um, I think we are having some of our sort of central metaphors uh, and concepts about the way we think about information are being are being questioned. Uh, I don't know. Back in the in the twentieth century, you know, oppressive regimes would uh, censor opposition or critics by by squeezing the amount of information by constricting it. Now they create troll factories which sort of swarm uh, the information space with so much disinformation that people can't tell the difference between truth and falsehood anymore. Uh, or also undermine uh, the reputation of, of critical journalists or opposition figures. But when you kind of try to catch them at it, they say, well, it's freedom of expression. What can we do? You know, the governments often claim they have nothing to do with these operations. Uh, you now have a whole ecology um, really exploiting the ideas of freedom of speech in order to stifle speech. That's a very new thing. Actually, that idea about freedom of expression always and often comes up in the United States, doesn't it, Karen? And I know uh, you are thinking about a digital democracy agency, about creating some way to formally tackle uh, this kind of abuse online. But, but surely you get that objection. What about free speech? Oh, exactly. And that's why I think it's very important to think of it, uh, to focus on the, con on the practices of the platforms as opposed to the content. What are the design vulnerabilities? Think of it much more as a cybersecurity analogy. What are the vulnerabilities that the platforms have introduced into the information ecosystem? And when you think about some of these micro-targeted ads uh, that have none of the transparency that you would have on broadcast television, uh, so um, folks can influence small pockets of the population without anyone else seeing it and being able to refute it, and it's very unclear who they are. So there were a bunch of ads right before the 2016 election pretending to be travel videos that showed that Sharia law had taken over in Rome and Hollywood and, you know, was coming to a neighborhood near you. And it was run by a group called Secure America Now, and there was no way to know the billionaires that were behind those ads. And then also the bots and the trolls, the deep fakes, uh, the shallow fakes. I don't know if you heard about this video that seemed to show Nancy Pelosi drunk, but they had just slowed, slowed down the video of her speech. So what an agency would do is insist on transparency, getting rid of some of these tools that allow the manipulators to pretend to be who they're not or pretend that something is true that's not. Just get rid of the, the fakery, put on nutrition labeling, if you will, and then um, uh, also provide something like that black box data recorder that we have when there's been an airplane crash that says what happened, some anonymized data so that when there's been a big disinformation campaign or a data breach, we can find out what happened. Uh, and then more user control, I think, is another thing. And then we have to do something to help save local news. Let's put some of those ideas to the others on the panel. But first, just whilst we're thinking about the idea of maybe a government agency to hit online hate and other uh, uh, fake news online, I want to bring in some of the tweets that you've been sending me because I, I asked this question online, how do you tackle uh, online hate and got a lot of responses. Uh, Mark Novak, for example, saying hate is learned and acquired. Whatever happens at home, shall be out on the streets and in society. So he suggests stamp out the hate from households. I'm not sure how. 
Uh, another of you says, don't fight it. Having free speech is more important. Uh, or eventually saying, you know, I hate the government will be a criminal offence. So that's another way of thinking about this. Uh, although Tom Harris uh, simply suggests kick Trump off social media. Uh, and I think was not the only person to make a similar suggestion. This does bring us up, though, to the fact of, you know, what a liberal society, liberal small l, should or can do. Uh, Claire, what do you think about um, Karen's idea of having a, uh, a digital democracy agency, a new federal agency to deal with this? I think we're at the point in, the, in this challenge where we have to look at all options. Uh, I think you don't need to uh, suppress free speech in order to do something about this challenge. You have uh, the right in many countries to your speech, but you don't have a right to make money off it. And by disrupting some of the financial incentives that uh, have a, a grown up in the last decade over the internet, we can significantly reduce the incentive for people to create this sort of content in the first place. One of our um, regular contributors, in fact, uh, Michael Goldfarb, tweeted uh, me to say, you've got to mention Popper's paradox of tolerance, which I had to look up. So uh, Karl Popper, the philosopher, first described this in 1945, the idea that in order to create a tolerant society, we have to be intolerant of intolerance. Uh, and, and Peter, I suppose this is the, the tension at the bottom of all this. Look, there are different traditions in different countries. So in mm. Germany, there is much less tolerance of anything that smells at all of far-right speech. Uh, in America, you have a vastly different tradition, and we have very different definitions of what hate speech is. Um, so I think when we're thinking about the content part, it's really hard to do coherent regulation. Um, I think um, instead of thinking about content, let's think about behavior and bringing transparency to behavior. I, as a user of the internet, should know if something is organic or amplified, whether it's a bot or a real person, whether it's a, a campaign or something that's actually been posted by so my mother-in-law. Karen talking about Completely. food labels, for so, example. So food labels, fine. That's, mm. that's, a, very, that's a good analogy. Um, but let's think about the right of the user online. We, I, in a way, we, we face a different form of censorship today, not of content, but of understanding how the information space around us is engineered and right. created. Um, it, it really is a black box, and we have to open that up, um, including, I think, understanding why algorithms, why computer programs choose one piece of information over another, certainly why I'm being targeted with a piece of information, which of my data has been used. So let's frame this as a rights issue for the user. Um, and then I think we're on to much healthier territory in terms of democratic discourse. Um, it still leaves open the question of crazy, nasty people online, but I think that has to be answered in a human way, actually, and not Ka just regulation. Karen, do you think that resonates with what you're saying, the idea that you can't squash it all, you can't be the better censor? but you can amplify understanding of what's going on. That's exactly right. And picking up on both those comments, I think the rights um, frame is exactly right, uh, that users, citizens don't know what they're seeing online, and they have a right to a lot more information and a lot more control and a lot more access to local news. Uh, these platforms are advertiser-supported. They are trying to keep you online and engaged with their algorithms so that you'll see more ads. And guess what keeps you engaged? Um, conspiracy theories do and outrage. And so that's what the algorithm is optimized to show but ben, you. Can I ask you Shouldn't all, you have control um, over that? Karen, Karen, first, who in, if it is a right, if we are going to talk in terms of rights, who enforces the right? Well, that's where we wind up uh, in this tricky conversation about regulators. Uh, and in the United States, the internet rose up in a deregulatory era when we all were so skeptical of the government. So how to think about using some of the new tools of the digital era to construct regulation in a way that doesn't give people that nervous feeling that you're going to have regulators who are in the pocket of the industry or that they're going to be inefficient and kill innovation. But there are ways to do that if we emphasize the things we've been talking about, transparency and user rights. Uh, I think you could have light regulation that um, makes the internet and our society really more resilient. And Claire, can I bring in the, we were talking earlier about the advertisers aren't necessarily the ones who decide where the adverts go. Yeah. But does that transparency apply to the commercial world as well? And that the mechanisms of, say, getting adverts and clicks online have to be shaken up? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, they call it the ad tech ecosystem. All the many different types of companies that are involved in placing ads online 
has grown uh, many thousand fold in the last 10 years. And it is a very opaque system that is actually very inefficient for advertisers. They are uh, only about 40 cents on every dollar from an advertiser's dollar is getting to the publisher at the end. And this is a problem not only for the advertiser, though less of their money gets through, it's also a problem for quality news sites that are seeing less and less of their money, less and less advertising money, and more and more going to more junky content. And we are now running out of time. But just very briefly, Peter, I want to ask, do you feel optimistic about the ability to, to hit online hate? You know, what I'm, it can definitely be done. We're not competing in this space. We've ceded the space to the Putins and the far right. And we, as in like, you know, people who believe in certain democratic values, we've, we've, we've really uh, been very lazy in reacting to this. So we have to start trying first. We have to start trying is where I'm going to have to leave it. Peter, Claire, Karen, thank you all for joining Impact Minds today. Thank you.